Hello class, this is Dr. Branch. Today we are going to discuss John Rawls and Justice as Fairness. I've talked about him some in class, but on the second half of this week, as, our, as we're moving forward with these videos, we're going to talk about his theory of justice as fairness. I will not touch on every slide in the slide deck, but I will have this slide deck and the notes posted on the class webpage. So John Rawls may be, and I think is, the most uh, influential political philosopher of the last 50 years. We've already talked a lot about him in class and some of his background. What I want to point out, it, I would like to point out, is the degree to which his military service in the South Pacific during World War II moved him away from Christian theism to a form of atheism. And at one point he had a professor, uh, excuse me, a chaplain that gave him some horrible advice that really pushed him over the edge. So we should always be careful about what we tell people and the pastoral advice we give them when they are in a, a moment of crisis. His most famous book is A Theory of Justice. That would probably be a fill in the blank or something like that on the final exam. It's a book title you should know. It's been very influential and it has shaped the way a great many people think about the social responsibility of political and social policies. So some background to his work. He's teaching at Harvard and he writes this book at a time when reform-minded liberalism is on the rise. This is President Johnson here issuing his address where he calls for an end uh, to poverty, his war on poverty. So there's this real we can do it sort of attitude to end poverty, to end injustice, and an enormous expansion in the welfare state during this era. I'm going to skip over the issue about uh, analytical philosophy, but if you will remember to the first part of the semester when we talked about metaethics, as an atheist, Rawls skipped right over metaethics and he went right to normative ethics. He's basically just trying to develop some sort of system to justify this sort of reform-minded liberalism. And so he skips over meta-ethics, doesn't deal with it at all. And he, he's basically looking for a reason why uh, reform-minded liberals can be reform-minded liberals. So here's his are his main ideas. I'm going to skip through this part here. First of all, he rejected utilitarianism. One of the things I would point out to you is if people as diverse as John Rawls and Dr. J. Allen Branch all tell, both tell you that utilitarianism is a bad idea, perhaps it's just a bad idea. He revised something called the social contract. You can read about that in my notes. But what I want you to remember for the exam and what you need to know are the two central principles I'm about to give you right here. So there, for the exam, you will need to know these two central principles from Rawls, and then two other terms, the veil of ignorance and uh, the original position. So let's talk about his two central principles. They are personal liberty, he wanted to emphasize that, and then the idea that social inequalities must be justified. So if one person is wealthy in a society and another person is poor, there has to be some reason to justify that difference. So let's talk about personal liberty. Here's what he said, to the extent that it does not impinge on the rights of others, one should have personal liberty, or to state it differently, each person should be permitted the maximum amount of basic liberty compatible with a similar measure of liberty for others. So he is not a libertarian in the way that we would use that word in American politics today. And the qualifying phrase here, that it is compatible with a similar measure of liberty for others. He's setting you up for his veil of ignorance experiment. So you have as much liberty as you can exercise without impinging on others. And the way he defines impinging goes back to justifying inequalities. If you've got the liberty to become very wealthy, there must be some reason to justify your wealth. If not, we've gotten to even things out. Which leads to the second point, that social inequalities must be justified. Rawls said that any social and economic inequalities allowed to exist must be such that they are A, reasonably expected to be everyone's at, to everyone's advantage, and B, attached to positions and offices open to all. Let's talk about both parts of that 
and on the final exam you want to tell me both parts of this social inequality. Do you see that there? There's two parts. Let's talk about this part. The social inequality must be reasonably expected to be every to everyone's advantage. To everyone's advantage. So what he means is this: If let's suppose someone is fabulously wealthy, uh, worth billions of dollars, and the rest of the folks aren't, of course, then Rawls would say there has to be some reason why that person's wealth is justified. Why do they have billions of dollars? And why do they have uh, fabulous wealth beyond our imagination? Is there some reason that that can be justified? It might hypothetically be justified that this person has accrued this wealth and they're giving it to other people or they've accrued this wealth and we need to pay them this much money because they have some freakishly unique skill that none of the rest of us have. And if we didn't pay them this money, then the rest of culture wouldn't get along. It would have to be something like that, although I believe Rawls would be hard-pressed himself to justify that sort of extreme wealth. I think on a more practical level, what he might say is something like this. Well, okay, we're, we are paying, let's say, for example, a heart surgeon or a brain surgeon. He or she is getting paid several hundred thousand dollars a year in salary. Well, that could be justified because these very, very gifted people might not go into this sort of heart surgery, which or brain surgery specialty that helps all of us if they weren't paid quite so much or because it took so many years for them to learn the skills necessary to have have uh, to become a brain surgeon or a heart surgeon then we have to pay them that much money to make up for all those years where they they weren't earning money which is very true uh, uh, when you're in med school you're, you're piling up debt but you're not making any money and then you have to go on and study the specialty once you get out of med school. It would have to be something like that, that there's some reason that justifies the indifference. Or, and it also, and this is the second part, so there's the first part, there has to be some reason, and it has to be attached to positions and offices open to all. So let's go back to our example of uh, heart surgeons, brain surgeons. What he would say is, and it has to be the case that people from both genders, or people from LGBTQ backgrounds as opposed to straight backgrounds, or people from every race and ethnic heritage, that the opportunity to be a heart surgeon or a brain surgeon, something so exclusive, is open to everyone. If not, then you have an inequality that has to be corrected. So that's what his, um, his two criteria. Keep those in mind. They'll be on the final exam. I expect you to tell me about them. The personal liberty principle and then the social inequalities must be justified principle, and then that has two parts, which is the um, that you see there. So uh, I have this. I picked up this from the internet somewhere, and this gives you an idea of what he's talking about. This silly little meme said, according to John Rawls' difference principle, social and economic inequalities are permissible as long as they are to the greatest benefit to the least advantaged members of society. This may justify the economic inequality that constitutes Bruce Wayne's enormous wealth as he requires his fortune to provide safety to the members of society who are not protected by regular democratic institutions. So it's okay for Bruce Wayne to be fabulously wealthy because if not, Batman couldn't come out in his Batmobile and protect all of us from the Joker. So that's one idea. So Rawls' definition of justice, uh, he says this, is the capacity to understand, to apply, and to act from the public conception of justice which characterizes the fair terms of cooperation. Circle that term fair. It is a willingness to act in relation to others on terms that they can also publicly endorse. So what he's saying is if you disagree with someone, you have to arrive at some neutral position where you both agree on this. And we'll talk about how that's a weakness in his system in just a moment, but he's going to say you act in relation to others on terms they can also publicly endorse. So, for example, if you're a heterosexual white male like me, I can only interact with an LGBTQ person on terms that that LGD, LGBTQ person can also endorse. So you see how this theory has shaped a lot of the, the public speaking, sort of what we might call politically correct speech in our culture today. Of course, here's the problem. I don't know what to do if the other person's terms are quite selfish. So that presents a major problem to his theory. 
And this also points to his notion of reasonable citizens. This is a term that pops up all the time, and it's a bit mysterious. Who are these reasonable citizens? What do we do with them? I think he means reasonable citizens are anyone other than Southern Baptists, but uh, he has a definition there that you can read. You need to understand his definition of reasonable citizens sets the parameter for who gets to make some decisions about what is actually a fair and just society, which leads to the original position and the veil of ignorance. You're going to need to know these two terms on the final exam. He presents us with a thought experiment. You saw it on the short video that led to the class discussion. And the thought experiment is, imagine you're standing behind a hypothetical veil of ignorance. This is you over here. So these androgynous creatures representing you don't know what sex you are, you don't know if you're male or female, you don't know if you are uh, what your ethnic heritage is, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, African, you just don't know. You, you don't know anything about your psychology, you don't know anything about the background in which you were raised, you know nothing about yourself other than you are some sort of a more uh, just vague sense of being human. Now. If you didn't know anything about yourself, what sort of rules would you set up for society to operate by? That's his question. And what he's saying is if you didn't know anything about yourself, then we would set up rules far different from what society is today. So right now, let's get rid of, imagine this is no longer the veil of ignorance. It's not here. And this is just, for example, James Allen Branch staring at culture as a white conservative Baptist Seminary Professor Mayo, and I'm setting up rules for culture. He says, if I operate from that position, I'm going to set up rules for culture that benefit me. Tax breaks, um, I don't know, some sort of laws about how people treat me and, and the language that's used or the way we interact on a day-to-day -day basis. He says, I'm going to set up rules to, to benefit myself. But if I didn't know, if I had no idea what I was going to be, then I would look at things very, very differently, and I would try to level the playing field so that everything would be uh, equal for everyone. So the veil of ignorance is this hypothetical barrier we are standing behind, and we don't know what, what we would be like on the other side, and we're trying to establish rules for a culture on the other side of the veil of ignorance we didn't know what we were going to be like. And the original position is this hypothetical thought experiment where we don't know our sex, our, our ethnic heritage, our financial standing, or anything. If we divorce ourselves from all those conceptions, how would we want society to look? And he is convinced that it would be a more fair set of rules that we would come up with. So this is going to be on the final exam. You're going to need to know those two terms. And Rawls said that people in the original position, here's a quote, have no specific information about themselves or their station, and they cannot identify themselves in any way. This theory has been widely influential with many people. Let me offer a few critiques, and these are just cursory, but perhaps will get you to thinking. I'll have my notes posted on the class page for you to look at. First of all, Let's just get out at the front. He excludes God. He's operating from an atheistic worldview. So he's trying to develop some vision of humanistic fairness by excluding God. Secondly, I would say the original position is not neutral. In his desire to avoid adoption of any particular moral, metaphysical, or religious system, he creates his own system rooted in individual rights he, uh, that Rawls personally found most persuasive but which may in fact be used to coerce me, a conservative Southern Baptist, a result I find quite unjust. So it is not neutral. I don't let him fool you. The original position is not neutral. To assume that I don't know anything about my religious uh, feelings or beliefs, well, that's, that's not neutral. That's actually adopting his atheistic system right here. So I'm, my personal critique is I think the original position assumes a form of atheism. I could be wrong. Others have rejected that. He has a flawed view of human sin, closely related with his re rejection of God. He expects no one to have envy. To expect that people standing behind the original position, no one's going to have envy there. And he's expecting sinners not to act like sinners, which is impossible. It's circular reasoning. 
it is impossible to achieve the original position from my perspective. Why would I say that? He expects to have or create a social theory divorced from society, but social theory is all about society. All of us come to these reflections, to these debates, with ideas, some of which we find more persuasive than others, some of them formed by our own background. A better, a better perspective, perspective is to evaluate our background, evaluate the ideas we are, to which we hold, and find out which of them are consistent with God's Word, which of them uh, are consistent with uh, loving our fellow man and uh, with forming a good government, with a more just society. I don't know about, uh, I don't know if we'll ever achieve perfect justice. I don't think we will, barring the return of Christ, but we can achieve a more just society. Basically, what Rawls' theory means is Christians need to shut up and go away. And this is, when he talks about the reasonable person, he's basically saying conservative evangelicals are not being reasonable. To give you one snapshot of that sort of thinking, let me give you this. this is, he, he doesn't like the family. And in fact, he says the family, because of its positions of power with a mother and a father and kids having to obey mom and dad, he says this actually sort of destroys the idea of social equality. And at one point in a theory of justice, he actually he reflects on the problem that the family poses for his theory. And he says this. This is a chilling statement. Is the family to be abolished then, taken by itself and given a certain primacy? The idea of equal opportunity inclines in this direction. That, my friends, sounds much like Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Which leads to my next point. It's basically a form of socialism. What he's actually advocating here is not so much a, a veil of ignorance in an original position. What he's pushing for is a socialist economic theory. And he also, in light of this, this is a common problem that uh, many Christians have brought up, is he neglects to consider how personal choice affects our status. I realize that there are inequalities in the world, and sometimes we're born into situations we did not cause uh, which provide us with many difficulties and obstacles. There are also obstacles in life that we place in front of ourselves by our own poor decision making, and Rawls neglects to emphasize that. So all of us are morally accountable for the choices we make, and even in the worst situations, we can always improve our situation by the choices and the responses we have in the most unjust economic situations is an issue he fails to address. John Rawls, Justice is Fairness, that's a brief overview and a brief response, and so you'll need to know about him for the final exam. I hope this has been helpful for you.